Okay, and Prue, can you just give me a thumbs up um, if you can see that screen fine? Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, do appreciate that introduction. Not sure where you found that little tidbit, but yes, I did uh, do a PhD over in Austria and got to work in the uh, European Alps, uh, which was, of course, uh, a great experience. I've also had eight years over on the eastern side of the States, but I've been back in New Zealand now for uh, 12 years. And of course, uh, a lot of the knowledge that we have here at the university that we accumulate over time is because we have that opportunity to work with our forestry companies as well as our logging contractors um, out in the field. So it's very much a shared knowledge space. Uh, and as such, I'm really happy to be here, part of this FICA webinar series and share some knowledge around costing, uh, costing of our machinery, uh, as well as uh, setting logging rates. So that's the theme of this particular webinar. I don't think you mentioned, Prue, I think there's a series of webinars. So there's another three webinars to come at one month spacing. And certainly those other three themes look really interesting. So hopefully uh, we'll look forward to those uh, presenters as well. So, um, Overview, uh, what I hope to cover in the next uh, 30, 35 minutes uh, is that background uh, around contractors, why we actually work with contracts and some of our knowledge around logging rates. Um, specifically because it's around costing, we're going to have a look at some of those costing methods that are actually available uh, to us, as well as I'll highlight some of the tools that we've got to support uh, costing and then tie that back into logging rates as well. So I mentioned hope to present for about 35 or 30, 35 minutes and leave plenty of time at the end for comments and or questions. So logging rate, uh, it is fair to say that in the Western world, uh, most of our forestry work is carried out by contractors. Um, there's a real reason for that. You can see those reasons down below is that the efficiency of uh, uh, the work being done by our logging crews really depends on not only the person managing operation, but it's also really capturing that motivation as well as the innovation of the, the crew members. The other reason you uh, would want to go towards a contracting type situation is for a forestry company to divest uh, in capital costs. And one thing that has certainly happened over the last uh, I mean, century, but even more so in the last decade, is that our harvesting systems have become really capital intensive. They're extremely expensive uh, to purchase and or operate. So some of those management issues are associated with logging as well. So that's why a forestry company prefers to work uh, in that space where they set up contracts uh, and working with a logging contractor. One of the key elements that really drives a logging contract, there's often many facets to it, uh, but one of that uh, bits of glue, I guess, that holds those two things together is, of course, that logging rate, how much a contractor will be paid for the services that they provide. Typically, that's in dollars per ton or dollars per cubic meter. I should note uh, that in New Zealand, I think I know of about four or five company crews. So while this is dominant, there's actually four or five company crews. So where the, the logging team is actually employed directly by the forestry company. And that particular model is actually common on, for example, Eastern Europe, or as you go through South America, um, they don't have this contracting situation. It's actually embedded. So it is a little bit special. The reason why we really go for this contracting environment is that ideally, if we set it up right, and if we do it right, the company, the forestry company, plays the lowest competitive rate and very much the best loggers, most uh, effective loggers, make the largest profit. So remember, that is very much part of it, is that the contractors who are doing well should be able to make the largest profit. That, in turn, will actually allow us to get the lowest competitive rate. Just to bring in some uh, data here. Uh, so uh, FGR, uh, Forest Growers Research, has a cost and productivity benchmarking system that I look after for them. We've got 12 uh, plus years of capturing system stand and terrain information from these contracts. We've got over 1,800 separate unique entries. And I know that uh, people are often interested in the, the data. So one of the things that we've been able to track uh, over time is the level of mechanization. Uh, so we see now in terms of our ground-based operation, 93% or basically 19 out of 20 crews have got mechanized felling. 
Um, but also, and this has been a very sudden shift in the last five years, actually 73% of our cable yarding crews now have some level uh, of mechanized fouling. And one of the drivers there is that 65% of our cable logging crews now have access to winch assist uh, type of equipment. So this system is actually picking up some of these changes. Mechanized processing uh, it was only 10 years ago, 50% of our ground base was still motor manual, uh, and now we're up well over 95%. So those smaller crews that perhaps are working on woodlots, they may still have motor manual, but most of our larger logging crews are very much mechanized. Again, just a couple of details there around machinery. Uh, so one thing that we've seen in ground-based is increase in number of machines, decrease in number of crews. So on average, last year, 4.7 machines with 5.4 crew members. Uh, it's almost one-to-one. -one. That means we're moving towards being fully mechanized. Every crew member is in a machine. In the cable yarding, that's still a little bit, the crews are a little bit bigger than machines, a little bit fewer, so we still have people on the ground. Something that most people are interested in, and of course, is the logging rate. So the average last year was $30 a tonne for cable logging, $43 a tonne. For the contractors out there, about half of you will be looking at that number going, oh, that's a pretty big number. Um, and the other half are looking at that and going, oh, that's far too less. Um, but that's because it literally is the average and we've got a very broad range around uh, all of the parameters that we have. Uh, another thing that's really nice to see is that our productivity on ground-based has been creeping up in terms of tons per hour. For our yarder system, it's really jumped up. So 10 years ago, the average crew was just doing 20 tons per hour. Uh, now we're up over 30 tons per hour on average. So those are just some of those um, numbers. Of course, there isn't just the FGR benchmarking database. There's other places where you can get logging rate uh, type information. So Agrifax is a commercial product that you can subscribe to. I've picked an older uh, example here because it's their information. I'm sharing it for an educational purpose. Um, so again, here they've got, they publish an average logging rate based on their surveys um, and they split it up by North Island, South Island. One of the reasons I'm just sharing this is I always find it quite interesting to actually look at some of the details. So for example, here on flat, presuming that's ground-based, you can see that the logging rate in the North Island is $6 a ton less than in the South Island. Um, you're, we're assuming it's the same job, um, but that's a more than 20% difference. So one way to look at it is that our North Island ground-based crews are a whole lot more efficient um, than the South Island crews. Uh, another way to look at it is our South Island crews are a whole lot more efficient at negotiating a competitive logging rate than our North Island crews. The flip side there is if you have a look at the last entry as in the steep or the hauler country, it turns over. So the cable logging in the North Island is more expensive than it is in the South Island. So again, it's hard to know exactly what's right, what's wrong, or what's driving some of these. Some of it will be competition, um, some of it will just be the, the conditions, but that's why we need to look at costing and productivity in more detail. The averages are interesting, but they don't always give, it, uh, give the information you need for your operation and or uh, your company. So in terms of the logging rate, it really is the contract is an agreement for providing harvesting services. And again, this is where I just like to go into a little bit of a detail. In New Zealand, most of us are dealing with what's called a CSL, which is a cut skid load rate. So that's a standardized term around the world. So we're talking about the conversion of standing trees into log products and loaded out onto a truck. So that's the CSL rate. Of course, in the contract, there's other aspects, quality, safety, and environment, very important as well, but it's the dollars per ton around the CSL that's quite critical. So if we have a look at the whole process, of course, it starts with planning, it starts with building infrastructure if it's not already present, and it finishes with trucking towards market. So many of our logging contractors work on that CSL, which means the planning is done by the forestry company, the roading landing construction is done by a separate contractor, as is the trucking. So our logging contractors provide this CSL service. One thing that's really quite unique uh, in a way to New Zealand, 
is nobody seems to chop up their trees as much as we do. I don't think there's a country in the world, not one that I've visited, that cuts a pine tree in as many different sorts as we do. And I think this has a real implication both on the logging rate as well as the cost in that almost 30 to 40% of our typical logging rate is actually in that processing. We have really complex processing systems uh, and we do it to uh, try and, of course, optimize our value recovery. But it is important to note that that's a real point of difference. There's many aspects. Um, so you can see our landings might look like this. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of st log stacks. There's quality control. There's equipment interacting with each other. There's log making, obviously very much focusing on the value recovery. But we do end up with quite a bit of waste being offcuts and or mistakes. Uh, that have been made. So there's the direct impact. The visual one that you can see is that for our logging crews, it's actually a very challenging task, this processing. Um, uh, the other thing is that there's a lot of subtle impacts. And Alex Toland was a, a gentleman who worked with me um, with 141 now and specifically looked at that. And again, there's more information available on that if you're after it. So what are some of the other systems um, that may be different? In this case, certainly simpler. So when we look at our logging rates and compare them to some of the European countries, especially Scandinavian countries, our logging rates are really quite high. There's a reason for that because most of our European counterparts just cut and skid. So they don't do the processing and loading. So I know that image, uh, so that's a Norwegian uh, logging operation in the top right there. So it's really just a two person, two machine crew. You've got a harvester in the background. You've got a four to bring the timber out, but they don't have to deal with the landing and or loading out because that's all being done by a self loading truck. It's not their responsibility. So you can see how you can really simplify a logging system by looking at what components are actually included in the rate. It's really important because cost, of course, depends on productivity and productivity of the system is only as good as its weakest link. So that's that bottleneck. So if we take these four elements, there's actually a lot of interaction for the planning. So in this case, the logging team is very dependent on the planning infrastructure being provided by the forestry company. And they're also very dependent on the markets and the trucking availability of course, for them to be able to load out. So it isn't, the system is not wholly within their control. They're providing a service, but they depended on planning markets, trucking on other entities to do their part so that they can be as efficient as possible. If, and I hear this quite often, if trucking is one of the major bottlenecks for your logging operation, um, one of the options that you have, and this has been adopted quite extensively in the southern USA, is that they include the trucking in the logging contract. So many of the loggers there, they don't want to rely on an external trucking service. What they do is include the trucking so the logging contractor owns the trucking, um, and they, so that they know exactly when their truck, where their truck is, and they can demand it. It's coming back to their site, not going somewhere else. We've actually got the first few contractors now in New Zealand that have moved to this particular format. So they have adopted uh, the trucking into their logging contract, and they are also providing the trucking service because it guarantees an efficiency within their logging crew that they can't guarantee if it's external. Another new way, and I was quite excited to see a couple of our um, companies and or contractors adopt this particular system. Another common complaint uh, from our logging crews is that the companies put the landings in the wrong place or that the roading isn't up to scratch, the planning is poor, or the planning is basically causing them to be inefficient. So one thing that some of our contractors have now adopted, they, they effectively do the planning together with the forestry company. Then they also take on the responsibility of building the landings and the roads. So the nice thing about that is our contractors now, because they've planned and they've built the landings, they can no longer complain about the location of the landing because they put it there. So again, it's that if you have a contractor that has that skill, or if you are a contractor that's able to do that, it may be a service that the company really likes and you can build that into the contract. 
So these are some of the exciting developments around how we do our contracts. They don't just have to be CSL. There's other ways and sometimes better ways of doing it. We'll dive into some of the costing now because that was one of the main themes of the title. Um, so the way that we often determine a logging rate, be it either a company or a contractor, is to have some understanding of what your system cost is and then also what your system productivity might be. And again, well aware quality, safety and environment, of course, also play a big part of it. But those two elements, the productivity is what we typically refer to as a target. Um, and then the cost is uh, normally known as a day cost, which we typically establish for a crew. And often this is established between the crew and a company. So the day cost is a known uh, uh, amount uh, that's agreed to by the contractor and the company. Okay, so within this, uh, the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to focus a little bit on the costing. Uh, the target uh, is uh, I'd need at least another hour or two to actually get into how you might set uh, productivity targets depending on site stand, uh, terrain and system conditions. In terms of our costing, things have changed. I mean, you can see those older images on the left when our old crew, you know, the majority of the cost might be in the labor, but for our modern fully mechanized crew, more than, well, 60 to 70% or for our highly mechanized crews running modern equipment, more than 70% of the cost is actually in the machinery. So while hopefully you will all say the people are important, uh, you know, my crew is important, when it comes to cost, it is actually costing out the machine that is most critical. It is the biggest cost component of the day rate and hence also of the logging rate that we have. Again, just some benchmarking data. Um, we shouldn't be surprised if at some stage we're struggling uh, with some of that. Our move towards mechanization is only less than 10 years old. Okay, so the Scandinavians, they've got 30 years of experience. But as you can see here by this tracking, our mechanization, we had this massive push based on safety needs. Uh, around about 2012, 2013, when we really started to push mechanization. And for example, that gray line there is mechanization of felling. You know, that's only really in the last five years or in the last two years that we've gotten up over 50%. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's been changes within the way that we need to cost our harvesting systems because of the level of mechanization that we have. So just getting into some of those details, and again, the caveat I have, you know, respecting the fact that we are working with contracts, the focus should be on the rate, not on the cost. But of course, having an accurate cost estimate is really important for developing a contract price that is fair. And I should note that fair is an important word because if it's not fair, it's actually not a contract. It's a legal component of a contract that a contract is Fair, otherwise it's not actually a legal contract. But we shouldn't just look at it for a contract price. If you really understand the costing systems and are able to cost your systems very well, you can start at looking at some of those cost drivers as it relates to planning, as well as uh, some of your machine and or system decisions. And I'll also provide an example of how you can use costing for a cost benefit uh, analysis. There's a couple of main methods if you want to split it up. Um, so three main methods, a cash flow, uh, which requires you to really dig into your accounts and or work with your accountant, very accurate, uh, but retrospective, not that flexible. The most common one that most people deal with is that machine rate or a spreadsheet uh, type approach because it's very useful for a negotiating uh, type process. But the last one we shouldn't ignore is I'm calling it phone a friend, uh, but it could literally be a friend. It could be somebody you trust within the forestry company you're working for. You could also seek external help and or expertise to get that type of information. An example of the phone a friend, if you've got a friend uh, up in Canada, uh, up in British Columbia, see logging costs and the cost of machinery isn't just a theme here in New Zealand. You can see obviously they've put a fair bit of effort into it up in British Columbia as well. So if you know any TLA or ILA members, uh, get on the phone and ask them for a copy of this because it really is very good. It provides uh, a nice level of detail and information for their loggers 
to help them and for their companies to help them uh, effectively negotiate and, and work on rates as well as evaluate different pieces of equipment. One of the things you can see right on the front there, you see the third bullet point, fuel price. I've probably had about five or six or seven inquiries over the last week, either from contractors and or company asking me how you might adjust a logging rate based on fuel price. Uh, so you can see it's obviously a theme for them uh, as well. The cash flow, so the other two uh, so that I'd focus on is the cash flow. Look, the cash flow method is actually really important. Um, it's really useful. So if you sum up all the machine and or system expenses for a year, and you divide by the working days that your crew have, you actually come up with the real day rate. So looking back over 2021, you could actually have a true day rate based on all of your costs. How might that work? If you had a skidder, and if your accountant or if you actually separated out your machine costs based on the machines you have, um, if you have own, uh, owning and operating costs, sorry, misspelled owning there, operating cost of $183,000 and you work 210 days, you've actually got a number, $866 is what it costs you um, per day. And then you can reflect back on the machine on the day rate that you would agree to with the company and look at that number and see, is it about the same or is it different? If it is different, why is it different? So it's actually an actual data point that you can use for your day rate, either on the machines or as a total cost. So the really good thing is that it provides an actual average day rate that you can work with. And it also allows you to review your actual expenses because as a contractor, contractors are by character, typically optimistic people. And if you ask them, you know, how much do you spend on maintenance? Most of them would have a very low estimate on the true cost of maintenance. So getting your accountant company to go back through and really sum up all of those maintenance costs, you would get a true appreciation of what you actually spend. Fuel might be another one as well. So the disadvantage of the cash flow method, first of all, it's retrospective. I've just talked about 2021. So that's a number, but that's already in the past. So if you've got an, an identical system, if you, next year you're running exactly the same system, then it's a really useful piece of information. But as soon as you start changing components of your system, that information becomes effectively out of date. It's also very poor at spreading out larger costs and it's not appropriate for negotiations because um, if you start getting into that level of detail, especially if you're working with other contractors, it can be considered price fixing and it also defeats the purpose of actually setting up a contract. So the thing I'd like to focus on most, and that's still because it is the primary way that we cost out machinery and harvesting systems, is this machine rate calculation. The machine rate calculation has really common components. So if you understand the components, the details become less relevant. So in a machine rate calculation, there's always some assumptions. Some of the assumptions might be quite factual, such as the purchase price. So you know well what you've paid for a machine. But for example, the salvage value at the point that you sell it will be an estimate, okay, will be an assumption. How many years you keep it for, how many hours you work per year. Again, these are assumptions that you need to make uh, whereby the interest that you're paying on the money that you've borrowed or the insurance will again be a very factual type number. So when you have these assumptions, you're actually, uh, what the spreadsheet does is it gives you an idea of what your fixed costs are, as well as what your variable costs are. Your fixed costs are the ones that you're going to incur whether you're running the system or not. The variable costs are the ones that are like fuel and tire, and repair and maintenance, they are incurred when you're operating the machine. Again, that labor cost, just when you use these spreadsheets, there's lots of different ways you can set them up. So some of them will say, without a person, the machine's not working. So labor has to be part of the machine rate calculation. Other people say, my people are separate. I'm just after the machine. So again, just be aware of that when you're talking about a total machine cost, does it include labor or exclude labor? So the big advantages here that you can see is that it's really quite simple. It's easy to understand. What you're doing is summing up all of the main costs 
not all of the detailed costs. So it helps identify those main cost components. Is it your ownership costs? Is it the variable cost? What's the biggest um, uh, cost component? Some of the disadvantages, of course, you do need to make those assumptions. Um, and it can also lead to a cost plus mentality is that, hey, if I pay my person more, I simply have a higher day rate, that's the answer. So again, we have to be aware of the limitations of that machine rate calculation. For the people listening in, if it's these spreadsheets are really easy to set up. Um, if you haven't done one, I'm happy to share one, no cost, uh, just email me or perhaps email Prue as well and I will give you the spreadsheet. So again, here in those blue cells, is if you type in those numbers, that's all I need or all you need to come up with a machine and labor or a machine only rate. It's as simple as that. And you can have a look at your average fixed. What's my depreciation? What's my interest costs on a per hour basis? So again, it's fairly straightforward to come up with a day rate. Uh, and of course, it's fairly easy to look at some of those details as well. There is a resource available in New Zealand. So we've got the FORM consulting group based out of uh, Wellington there. And they actually put together a booklet called the INFORM uh, and they actually provide this information as well. So, but again, what you can see is here, when you look at the INFORM spreadsheet or the output page here, there's a lot of numbers. But what you can see here is that these will be the assumptions. So these are the assumptions that form is making. And we have outputs, including our fixed costs, as well as our variable costs. So again, understanding the system helps you understand the outputs uh, that in this case, Inform is providing you. Um, some of the caveats here, again, you know, it looks like a lot of detail. Um, being a university person, I often look for the asterisks. And so here, if we look at that asterisk, if we go down the bottom, it's based on a single sample. So again, it might be a useful reference point to you if you've got a medium sized skitter. On the other hand, know that form have done this calculation based on a single skitter themselves. So again, it's just being aware of the information that you're working with. Here's some really nice information. Again, just sharing some of the details um, uh, that we know fuel use. So typically just depends on engine size, but also the load factor as well. So there's a couple of equations there. And to date, so for a piece of ground-based equipment, 0 0.16 times kilowatt, and that gives you your liters per hour. For a processor, 0.22, because it's got a higher load factor. For a yard, is 0.11. So this is where you can at least make it calculation as to what your fuel use is and compare it with your actual fuel use, but you can put that in. Oil and lube, again, people often talk about the cost of oil and lube. So far, a really good ballpark figure is 15% of the total fuel cost will be in lube. So as your fuel cost goes up, so does your lube cost obviously go up as well. Some of the challenges, um, so repair and maintenance is always a big cost in any spreadsheet. And that's a really, really difficult number to get at, mainly because most contractors are hesitant to release that level of information. So the spreadsheets often make an assumption and the assumption is that it's just a percent of depreciation. So FICA have just come out with that uh, new uh, business of management handbook I uh, believe Mark Blackburn uh, was one of the main authors uh, that updated it from the Lira one. So you can see here, Mark's actually, or Mark and his colleagues has made the effort to actually look at that repair and maintenance cost. And they've given you a range of percentages based on the operating conditions. So again, if you don't have a good handle on maintenance, it's a really nice reference point for you to compare your system against. Purchase value, um, so here again, we've got some information, it's available from us. Uh, in this case, it was a gentleman by the name of Conor Fahey. Uh, he did his dissertation with myself. He looked at the resale salvage value of equipment. Uh, you can see that it's really quite variable. We actually compared New Zealand and USA as well. But look, some of those ballpark figures is that our equipment is worth about 50% at 5,000 hours and it's worth about 25% at 10,000 hours. And if you read his report in detail, he actually breaks it down by machine type, as well as referencing some of those differences in 
perhaps the equipment or accessories that it has. So again, there's some good information available for us to benchmark our uh, spreadsheets against. The cost of fuel. So the other spreadsheet, so you've got your basic costing spreadsheet. Again, the blue is just those inputs that you have. And what I've done is here, I've set up a spreadsheet which has got two identical columns. And then what you do is just change one of the numbers. So what we've done here is fuel is a buck fifty, or it was, not anymore. And so I'm, what I'm doing is putting it up to a dollar sixty. Okay, that's the only thing I'm changing. What the spreadsheet then allows you to do is actually have a look. If you look on the right hand side, you can see what difference does it make when fuel goes up ten cents. What difference does it actually make to owning and operating the piece of equipment? So what we know is that it's about two percent. So ten cents up gives you a 2% increase in total machine cost. If you start to include the labor and the rest of the system, it's more like one and a half percent. But it's basically, if you go up 30 cents, all of a sudden you're getting a 6% increase and or a four and a half percent increase in the total system. Okay, so those are those two numbers or three numbers there. Again, within that um, business management logging handbook, it was updated in 2020. It's freely available from uh, FICA. Um, so it includes uh, some of these spreadsheets. It also includes an Excel costing model that allows you to integrate up to 10 machines. Um, this is what the front page looks like. It looks pretty intense, but it's actually relatively easy to use. Um, so what you can see is that it allows you to include 10 machine, it allows you to include vehicles, chainsaws, labor units, and it comes up with a total daily cost for your harvesting system. Focus again, again on the impact of fuel. So one of the queries I got uh, over the last week is what percent of the total cost is fuel? So you can see under that current scenario, about 20% of this particular operations cost was in fuel and oil on a daily basis. Okay, so again, we've got a lot of tools that allows us to get some of those details. Just wanted to provide one example uh, of how you might use costing to help you choose equipment. Uh, you will know that a lot of our Australian counterparts, a lot of our Scandinavian counterparts, like running forwarders. Uh, we like running grapple skidders on ground-based operations, whereby forwarders have certainly come up. I think about 15% of our operations now are forwarders, uh, but the bulk of them are still skidders, grapple skidders. So why would you go to a forwarder? Well, they cost a lot more on average than a grapple skitter, but they've got a much bigger capacity. So that makes it quite challenging for us to figure out what's the better option. When you start to include some of that productivity detail, in this case, I've just put one parameter in, which is the speed. A skitter is a fair bit quicker than a forder. A skitter can pick up and drop off a lot quicker than a forder. Um, but again, a forder can carry a lot more. And again, if you've got that cost and some productivity information, you can actually start to make some rational decisions around at what point in time does one system or one machine type become preferable to another. So forwarders nearly always are more cost effective at longer extraction distance. Skidders are nearly always more cost effective at shorter. And that break even point can be quite critical depending on your typical planning and the operation that you've set up. Look, the holy grail for um, us is to, you know, if you were to give us a forest and some terrain information and a harvesting operation, we'd stick it through a calculator and come up with a logging rate as well as a target. There's no such thing available. So some companies have some of that information. Most of this type is actually in people's head. Very experienced people will have a pretty good idea. A particular harvest system at a particular site will have this type of a target and this type of a logging rate. So they're actually very complex systems to build. However, there has been a push, and again, um, uh, credit to FGR here. So just moving forward, there's actually three different woodlot costing models. I've made one, which we use here at the University of Canterbury. Uh, so based on some basic parameters, I can give you a logging rate. There's also a Watts interface developed by FGR by Glenn Murphy there. But the image I've got down below is actually, if you go to treefarmer.fgr.nz, you literally click on estimate cost, tree harvesting estimate cost. You get to put a boundary around your woodlot, put a road inside, flick a few landings in, 
and it'll come up with a cost to do the job. <coughs> so there's some pretty neat tools out there around costing now. So in summary, um, look, calculating machine costs is really important for getting a fair or accurate, or accurate logging rate. I very deliberately put that image in there on the top right hand side. So we're always exploring new harvesting systems. So this is with Rainier in the Hawke's Bay. Uh, so Winchester forwarder, where we've got a, a machine we know. So we know forwarders, we know winch assist, we know steep terrain, but we've never really run a forwarder on winch assist on steep terrain. So it brings up the question, what is the realistic cost and or productivity of a system like that? Um, so understanding these machine costs helps us optimize systems and choose the right one. There's no magic answers, but there's plenty of supporting information as well as tools out there. And I hope within this short webinar, I've highlighted at least some of them if you didn't know them already. So with that, Prue, thank you. And I will stop the share and open it up to questions.